you would please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. We'll pick up where we left off, I believe, a couple weeks ago. Mark chapter 11, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 14. And then we're going to pick up the narrative at verses 20 through 26. This is one of those cases where Jesus does something, and then the results of it are a little bit later, kind of like in Matthew 13, where you'll have the parable or have a certain parable, and then you'll have the explanation of it coming later in the chapter. Uh, That's what we find here. So what I'd like to do is just read verses 12 through 14, and then read verses 20 through 26. Mark writes, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and on the next day when they had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he answered and said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Down to verse 20. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it shall be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they shall be granted you. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you for your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, as you know, Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. Last week we saw his triumphal entry, uh, riding the, the donkey into the city, presenting himself to Israel as her king and as the fulfillment of all of God's promises to his people. Now again, the narrative breaks off from there because it was late. Uh, Jesus departed from there and he went to Bethany and now it's morning and now he's returning to Jerusalem. Um, Mark says he became hungry, saw a fig tree in the distance, went to it to see if it had any fruit but found that there were only leaves because it wasn't the season for figs and so Jesus cursed the tree. And in the morning as they're passing by, Peter noticed that it withered, pointed it out to Jesus And Jesus turns it into a lesson on prayer. He says, if you have faith, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be taken up and be cast into the sea, and do not doubt that what you have asked is going to happen, it will be done for you. And whatever you ask believing, God will give it. Now, obviously, our Lord is giving to us this morning a lesson on prayer, And something which I think is very timely, especially considering that last Lord's Day evening we saw a good deal that had to do with prayer. I hope it made an impact in each one of our lives that we've been praying more uh, because prayer is essentially the way that God uh, does the work of his kingdom through us. We pray, we ask for his blessing, he gives us strength, and we do his work. This morning is a very important reminder, again, of what we can expect when we pray. But there's actually three things in this, and they're all really tied together. One of them is not so obvious. The other two are, but we're going to look at all three of them. The first thing is there's a reminder, and I think it's an important reminder, considering what we saw last Lord's Day morning with regard to the minus, that as a believer, you will bear fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, you're not a true believer. Second, we're we're going to see the promise that we've been focusing on this morning, that if you ask anything believing, that God will give it to you. And then thirdly, we're going to see a condition to the answers to those prayers. Your requests must be accompanied 
by a forgiving heart. Otherwise, the Lord will not hear you. So first of all, let's look at the reminder that as a believer, you will bear fruit. Now, it may seem like the cursing of the fig tree is just a random event, but it isn't. Because when Jesus Christ came looking to the fig tree for fruit, Jesus knew that it wasn't the, the, the season for figs. He really had no reasonable expectation that there were going to be figs on that fig tree. And yet, he did not come to the fig tree by accident. So why did Jesus come looking for fruit on a tree he knew there would be no fruit on, and why did he curse the fig tree? Was it just to give the disciples a lesson in prayer? Well, actually, when you compare parallel accounts, you'll see that there was more going on than just that, especially when you read this particular parable that Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. And let me read that for you. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. And I think you'll know, especially if you've heard any of the you know, many teachings that have been on the radio and so forth over the years regarding prophecy and so forth, that very often uh, the, the, the teacher, the expositor, will look at the fig tree as, as a picture of Israel. You know, with the idea of uh, from the time, you know, when you see the, the fig tree putting forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. And very often they draw the analogy, well, that's referring to Israel. I think in that case, though, it isn't. <laughs> but in, in many cases, it actually is. And what the Lord is, is doing here is he's using the fig tree as a picture of Israel, his people. Basically, the Lord had planted this fig tree. And he had planted it in a good land, the land of promise. And he had given the fig tree fertilizer. He had given to it everything that it needed to bear fruit. Basically, he gave his people his word. He gave them his worship, his sacraments, his spirit, his law, and his ordinances, all of which were meant to lead them into the truth so that they might be fruitful. What God wanted them to do was circumcise their hearts. Don't have a hard heart towards me anymore, but listen to me. Do what I say. Worship me, love me, serve me, and I will bless you. But for the most part, as you know, as Jesus comes into Israel at the beginning of his ministry, it's pictured as one coming into a dark area, into the darkness the light shines. And that's because Israel's hearts were, for the most part, still hard. There were a few believers, but very few which means that Israel as a whole, as a nation, remained fruitless. Our Lord will actually shortly warn them, and we're going to see this in, uh, I believe it's the next chapter, the parable of the vineyard, which basically tells them that since they would not repent, since they would not trust him and do his works, even though he ministered among them for three years, three and a half years, and since they would reject him and crucify him, the Lord was about to bring judgment on them, to take away the kingdom from them and give it to another nation. Basically, that's what the cursing of the fig tree is all about. The Lord was about to bring a curse upon Israel. Jesus will say, not in Mark's gospel as much as in Matthew, that all the righteous blood shed on earth was going to be charged to that generation and the Lord was going to hold them accountable for it. In other words, 70 AD was around the corner. The Lord was going to destroy their city. He was going to destroy their temple. His glory was going to be removed, and he was going to begin dealing with another people made up of believing Jews and Gentiles. Now, as I've said, this serves as a reminder to us that though we may profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our life has to show the reality of that profession. It actually has to be changed. It has to bear fruit. 
If your life doesn't show that reality, if you're not bearing the fruits of righteousness, or to put it in terms of what we saw last week, if the mina that the Lord has entrusted to you is not making more minas or even gaining interest, in other words, you're not doing anything with what the Lord has called you to do, then you are not a genuine believer. You see, you can't have the Spirit of God in your heart and not be changed from the inside out. And if you're not a true believer, as we saw last week, you will end up being cursed just as the slave who took the mina and hid it. He was treated in exactly the same way that the Lord's enemies were who would not submit to him. Because as a matter of fact, this slave who had the one mina didn't submit to his Lord. And that was the problem. He didn't take what his Lord had given to him. And his Lord told him, trade with this. And when I come back, I'll receive whatever it is you gain. Well, the servant didn't obey. He didn't trade. He didn't bear fruit. He didn't do his master's will. And so when his master returns, he is treated like the rest of his enemies who did not want this man, this Lord, to rule over them. So this, first of all, is a reminder. Make sure that you are a believer in more than profession only. Make sure that you're turning from every sin, from everything that the Lord tells you is sinful and wrong. Make sure you're trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that you are serving him, working for him by the power of his spirit to produce the fruit in your life that he desires to produce. Again, think of John chapter 15. Jesus says, every branch of me that bears fruit, my father prunes it that it might bear more fruit. Every branch of me that doesn't bear fruit is cut off and thrown into the fire and it's burned. There's you know, a common theme that's woven through all these things and that is again that the Lord would have us to be fruitful and what that means is we do need to submit to him we do need to serve him. So that is the reminder, first of all. Secondly, we see a promise. If you ask anything in faith, he will give it to you. Now, if you are a believer, which is evidenced by the fact that your life is bearing fruit, here is a promise for you that will help you bear even more fruit. If you ask anything believing, he will give it to you. Again, not only will you do what was done to the fig tree, but Jesus says you will do much greater things. Now, do you think that Jesus really means this? I think sometimes we think he doesn't, but he actually does mean this. He will do this. Now, do you think that he meant this only for his disciples, only for the apostles, or did he mean it for you and for me? Well, I think the Lord intends it to be for us as well. It's for his whole church. Now, does this mean then that if you ask for anything at all, you can ask for whatever you want, that God will give it to you? You can ask for a billion dollars, and you just, if you believe strongly enough that the Lord is going to give it to you? Well, not necessarily. You know, he may or he may not, depending upon his will. I think you know as well as I do that this passage and the ones we've read like it and others that are like it in the Bible have been twisted out of its context and, and used in the modern health and wealth movement, basically to say that whatever you want, whatever it is, whatever your lustful heart desires, just ask and believe. I've seen some go even as far as to say that you can, like God, call into existence things that don't even exist. Just, just say the word and it will be done as though you can speak it into existence, as though you're God which is absolutely blasphemous. It's absolutely wrong. The Lord is not saying that you can have whatever you might desire if you just simply believe strongly enough. The Lord makes it clear in other parts of Scripture that there are other things that must be true of what it is you are asking for in order to ask in faith in the way that Jesus says you must ask. Because he does say, ask believing. You have to believe and not doubt. But how can you believe and not doubt that what you are asking for, God is going to give to you? On what grounds can you do that? God has never made a promise in Scripture that he's going to fill your pocketbook with a million or a billion dollars, has he? So that upon what grounds can you ask God for something? 
Well, I think it's obvious that what you ask for needs to be God's will. Certainly it needs to be his revealed will. And again, as we, as we take all the passages in Scripture that have to do with prayer, we see that that is in fact the case. John writes in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, and listen very carefully, because this gives us the condition. This is the confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Now, did you notice the qualifier that was in there that we didn't see in the other passages? And actually, if you read just the second of those two verses, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests we have asked from him. It, it seems to leave that one element out, but yet it is understood in all of these promises what we ask for must be God's will. So how can you ask knowing, believing, not doubting that the Lord is actually going to answer your prayers. Well, he has to promise to give it to you because that's the grounds upon which you can ask and know. Now, if you're a believer, you need to realize the Lord has made you many promises. By the way, I should back up and, and say this. You need to ask in the name of Jesus. It has to be according to his will, and you do have to be one who's bearing fruit. We're going to see in a moment that you also have to be one who forgives. In other words, you have to be a certain kind of person, and then you can ask for certain kinds of things. And there's other things we're not going to take time to look at, but there was one very wise uh, statement by a Puritan. It was um, Thomas Shepard who said this, that if you would embrace the promises of God, you must be willing to embrace the whole Bible and not just the promises. You know what he means by that, don't you? You can't just say, I'm not going to obey you, Lord. I'm not going to serve you. I'm not going to do what you want me to do, but you promised to give me this, so you've got to pay off. No, if you're going to embrace the promises, you have to embrace the Bible. You have to embrace all of it. You have to trust in Jesus, turn from your sins, seek to obey him. And then he will answer these prayers. But if you've met those qualifications, the Lord has made you many promises. And do you know what those promises are? I mean, do you know what it is that God says in his word that he will actually give to you if you will just ask and believe that he is trustworthy and faithful? Yeah, can you think of a better reason to read your Bible than, than this? And do you believe that God is actually going to give you the things that he has promised in his word that he's going to give you? That all you have to do is ask and believe that he is true to his word and he will give it to you? You know, if, if that's what you believe, are you asking? You realize that God has promised to give you every single thing you need in life, everything you need to live in this world. He's promised to give you food and clothing and, and covering and so forth, shelter. If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. The Lord has promised to give you everything that pertains to godliness too. If you need more of his spirit, he says, ask and he will give you more. If you need wisdom, ask and he will give you wisdom. If you need guidance, he will give you that. The Lord has given you his word. He's given you his spirit. He has given to you everything and he's willing to give you more, more understanding, more wisdom, more of his spirit and so forth if you will simply ask him. Now Jesus said to his disciples, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Now he says the same thing to you this morning. He knows how great your needs are. You know how great your needs are and how much you want to serve the Lord, how much you want to be useful to him. If that's the case, come to the throne of God because he promises to you that he will strengthen you, give you boldness, give you courage, give you power to do his will if you will ask and believe that he is true to his word. By the way, I should also add, there are many things that we may need that uh, are, are more specific and yet we may not have an exacting promise for those things. 
but yet the Lord may desire to give those things to us. In cases like that, when you pray, pray as our Lord Jesus did in the garden when he was seeing if perhaps there was another way salvation might come rather than going to the cross, having our sins imputed to him, the sins of his people, and then suffering the wrath of God. He says, if it's possible, Lord, Father, let this cup pass from me. But if it isn't, your will be done. So in cases where we may not know exactly what God's will is, we just simply say, Lord, if you're willing, and if it is your will, Lord, then do this. And if not, then don't do it. Let your will be done. But in those areas where he has made promises, that is his will. Pray for those things. And God will hear. He will answer in his time. He will give you everything that he has promised. You just need to believe he is trustworthy, that he will do it. So we see a reminder that we do need to be bearing fruit and that we will, in fact, be bearing fruit if we're true Christians. And if we are true Christians, we have a promise. And that promise is God will give to us whatever we ask according to his will. And don't forget to pray in the name of Jesus because you have no grounds to come to him except through Jesus Christ. He's the one who has opened the door. He is the door to the Father, the only way, not just for salvation, but also for your petitions. You need to come through Jesus. He's the mediator. But then thirdly, we find a condition. You must be willing to forgive. We all must be when we ask the Lord for something. Verses 25 and 26. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Now what does the Lord mean by this? I think the second verse is really the key. How can you pray knowing that God's going to answer? Well, it's because he's promised. But also because you forgive. That is one of the indicators that God's going to hear your prayers. Okay, we've already seen one. You have to be bearing fruit. You have to be obedient to the Lord. You have to pray knowing that this is his will. It's God's going to give it to you. But you have to be praying forgiving. And if you are able to pray in, in a way that you're at the same time, you think about those people that have offended you and done wrong things to you, that you're able to forgive them. That's another indicator that God will answer your prayer. Now, what does forgiveness have to do with this? Why does it seem like the answers to our prayers and even our own forgiveness is contingent on our ability to forgive others? Have you ever read the Lord's Prayer and you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and then you look at the explanation at the end, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. Doesn't it sound like your forgiveness and the answers to, to prayer are based upon your ability and actually the fact that you do forgive other people? I mean, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, I think what he's saying is that if you're able to forgive then you show, just like the first reminder reminds us, that you are a true believer. Because what is a Christian? A Christian is not just somebody who went forward at an altar call and prayed the sinner's prayer. I mean, that person may or may not be a Christian. It's not the prayer or the coming forward that makes them such. Some people think that everybody who comes forward and prays that prayer is saved, and it doesn't matter if their life isn't changed at all, they're still a Christian and going to heaven. That's not what the Bible actually says. What it says is, if you trust in Jesus Christ and turn from your sins, then you are saved. But how can you tell that a person is saved? Well, again, it's if their life is transformed. If you are becoming like Jesus Christ, that is the evidence that you are saved. It all boils down to one principle, and that is love. You love what the Lord loves. You love like Jesus Christ. You're becoming like him. Love is what moves us to do what we do. And if you have that same kind of love in your heart that Jesus has, then it's going to move you to do the same things that he did. Now, what did Jesus Christ do with regard to the people who offended him? 
and the people that betrayed him and the people that, that beat him and mocked him and crucified him. I mean, what did Jesus say to them? I'm never going to forgive you. I'm going to destroy you. No, that's not what he said. Actually, what he did was he prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he prayed that for those who crucified him. Now, I can't think much more, you know, much more offensive thing than that. If somebody is taking your life, he's inflicted, you know, mortal wound on you and you're dying. Uh, you know, what, what more can they do? Well, maybe we could think of some worse things, but that's pretty bad. And the way Jesus responded was not, Lord, send legions of angels to destroy them. But he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, I believe what the Lord is saying here is that if you're a true believer, then you will have that same kind of heart that Jesus had. And when you pray, you will be exhibiting that kind of heart by forgiving people who have offended you and done things against you. You will forgive when you pray. If you're at odds with someone else, especially if that person be a brother or sister in Christ, you'll be grieved if you're not reconciled to them and you'll want to be reconciled to them, you'll not be happy or comfortable in the fact that there is something outstanding between you. Remember how our Lord says, as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with one another, which means we're not supposed to be giving offense. Well, if the same thing were true with regard to uh, the people who have offended me, if it were up to me, this, this you know, uh, offense and this, this barrier between us wouldn't exist. It has to be on the other person's head only and not on yours, you see. It has to be in their heart and not in your heart. You need to be one who desires to be reconciled if it were purely up to you. And you'll do everything that you can to be reconciled with others. You'll meet with them. You'll tell them uh, basically what Jesus says to do in Matthew 18. If they've sinned, you'll go to them in private and you'll... Try to bring them to repentance. Try to point out their sin for them. Try to get them to turn. And if they don't turn, then you'll be willing to go the extra step to bring two or three or one or two more with you to try to turn them. And so also if they don't turn, that you'll have the number of witnesses you need to bring it to the church. But again, you're not doing that vindictively. You're not doing it because you want revenge for what they did to you or what they did to somebody else. But you're doing it because... You care about that individual and you want them to turn away and they have not turned away. That's the kind of heart that you will have. And if it isn't, you see, if you're not willing to forgive, if you're bearing grudges and nursing grudges against other people, and if you're doing nothing to be reconciled to them, and especially with your brethren, then you have every reason to suspect the Spirit of God is not in your heart because where the Spirit of God is, He will not allow you to rest comfortably with that kind of a situation. Now, I, I do know that there are situations where you've done everything you can and that person will not repent. They will not admit their fault. They've injured you. They've offended you, but they will not repent. You're not going to be reconciled to them if that's the case, but don't be bitter against them. Don't hate them, but pray for them. Pray that they might repent. Pray that they might turn around, that God might grant them repentance. That's something that he gives. Okay, we can't change a person's heart, but we can certainly pray to the one who can. So if you're, but if you're in, again, in a position where you're not willing even to do that and you hate that person and you bear a grudge against that person and so forth, you're embittered, know that that is not of the Spirit of God. The Lord says that if we pray, we need to stand praying and forgiving others. And if we don't forgive, then we won't be forgiven. So basically, if you can pray and you can have this kind of attitude in your heart where you really do wish well those who have offended you and injured you and you really do desire their repentance and you do want to be reconciled to them and you're able to forgive whatever it is they're willing to come and confess to you and ask for your forgiveness, you're, will, you're stand there ready and willing to forgive if you, if you have that kind of a heart, then you can know that you're forgiven. And you can know that the Lord will hear and answer your prayers when you pray according to his will. But again, if you can't forgive, if you don't want to forgive, then you need to know that you are not 
forgiven until your heart is changed in this way. I don't think there's any room to wiggle in Scripture on this. We need to be those who forgive. Now, if you find that that's the case with you this morning, that you don't have forgiveness in your heart and you're bearing grudges and nursing grudges and you would really rather see the curse of God fall on, on that individual than see him forgiven. And that reminds me of James and John, remember? After they had gone out to one of the cities of Israel and they rejected Jesus Christ, they wouldn't listen to them. And so as they're leaving the city, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus said, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't come to destroy men. I came to save them. No, that's not how he wants us to be. But if that is what is within your heart, then you need to come to the Lord and ask him to change your heart, to take away the heart of stone, that hard heart of bitterness and anger, and to give you a heart of flesh so that you might trust Jesus Christ to save you and turn from your sins and that he might forgive you the sin of a hard and ungracious heart and give to you a heart that desires to forgive. Now again, as I mentioned before at the end of some of the last sermons, we've just heard several important things. We do need to be bearing fruit. That's the evidence that we are true believers. We do have a promise given to us. If we ask anything according to his will in the name of Jesus and don't doubt that God's going to answer our prayers, he will give it to us. But we must be that kind of individual that forgives. Otherwise, we have no right to ask and no reason to expect that God's going to hear us. Are those things important? You know, those things are, are very important. I can't imagine anybody who calls himself a Christian who doesn't read the Bible to see what it actually says and then seeks to do what the Bible says. This isn't a game. This is, this is reality. And we need to listen and we need to do. So the, the reason why the Lord has appointed preaching in the church is so that we would uh, hear these things, we would understand these things, and we'd be encouraged to do these things. Remember Jesus says, do you know these things? Blessed are you if you do them. If you know them and don't do them, well, that just adds to what you're responsible for on the day of judgment. Don't just listen and not do. Remember what the Lord has said. Remember what James says, the person who looks intently at the law of liberty and sees, sees what he is, sees what needs to change, and then he walks away and he doesn't change. He becomes a forgetful you know, hearer. That man's actually going to end up being cursed. He's not going to be blessed. But the one who looks at the law of liberty and doesn't become a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, that one will be blessed in what he does. It's not enough to hear it. We actually have to do it. So let's pray that the Lord would give us the grace to do that. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's pray that the Lord would apply his word to our hearts in, in these three areas in particular.